Hi, everybody. So I'm going to put this in uh, answered so you can see them. So the first question is, help. I've deeply hurt my wife and greatly affected her life and sense of security with my addiction. Even though I'm in a recovery program, I still have trouble hearing her in discussions without a great deal of shame taking me out of the conversation, which leaves her feeling even more alone than before. How do I stop being an asshole, stop hiding from pain, and just be present for her? Great question. Um, so uh, I often bring this up at the treatment center. The guys often ask, this comes up a lot. And my answer to you really is very simple. It's um, stop thinking about yourself. Um, Tammy's going to be frustrated because we're having, are we having internet problems? I will do my best to fix them. I think you are, are having internet problems because, but I mean, because you're okay. cutting in and let out. Let me try a me. better spot. Okay. Okay. So let me try a better spot. You mind if I move? I, I would, I'll now. take you. He's moving. He's moving. <laughs> Sorry. So I do want to answer that question. Um, I know Please. I can't get any internet service where I was, so I have to go to talk up here. Okay, so um, my simple answer is that <laughs> that shame is really all about the self. So in the sense that when I'm ashamed, I'm angry at myself. I did something wrong. I hate myself for it. And the problem with that is, is that it doesn't look at my partner at all. So my partner is sitting there angry and upset, and I'm thinking about how horrible I am. That isn't empathy. That isn't providing them with the opportunity to hear, you know, while I'm busy hating myself, I could be saying things like, I can't imagine what you're going through or how hard this must be for you. Or So I will say to clients, and I think this is probably not exactly right, but close to it, that there's a very narcissistic element in shame. It's a lot about me, you know, how terrible I am, how awful I am, but it's all about me. And if you want to have a more empathic approach to your partner, think about what they've gone through. And when you start going into what's wrong with me and I'm so terrible, just stop yourself and say, wait a minute, this is not productive. And then move on to something that is, which is empathy will always be productive. Tammy, do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, I think the, the clue to wait a minute is if you're feeling really uncomfortable and wanting to defend or whatever, that's when you take the deep breath and go, wait a minute, this is not serving me well. So, and go, this isn't about me. This is about, you know, me showing up for them. So, but, but I think it's so easy as addicts to get caught up in the, oh, I'm uncomfortable. And like, you know, like you don't understand or whatever, or just needing to escape. So, so really just being grounded and going, I can do this, you know, um, and, and, you know, uh, we've given lots of tools last week, Wednesday, Scott talked about bookending and things like that. I think having uh, a time to talk so that you are prepared, you've done your grounding, you've called your sponsor, and you go, this is the time we're going to talk about these difficult things. And so then, then it's 20 minutes on Tuesdays at seven o'clock or whenever it is, but it's like, this is the finite time. So then it isn't just this stuff can happen at any given time. You, you know, it's coming, you can prepare for it. You can call your sponsor before you can call your sponsor after, you know, and, and it's contained. Um, I think having structure for both of you so that you know, it's a safe space can really make a difference. But I agree with Dr. Roberts. If, if shame keeps you focused on you, you know, it's narcissistic, but it's also not useful. It's not helping either one of you get out of the spot, the negative spot you're in. Okay, so I'm going to do the next one. I'm going to put this in answered. So the next question, I am a male in my early 30s and I'm a sex addict. I also suffer from body dysmorphic disorder, only related my face due to being teased by my facial features growing up. I moved uh, to a country and by accident found out that my facial features were seen attractive and suddenly women started to pay attention to me, which was something I had never experienced before. So I got hooked on getting attention from strangers. In your experience, is it common for sex addicts to have body dysmorphia? Do you think I should treat my body dysmorphia first as part of my sex addiction? That's an interesting and great question. What do you think? Well, I, I would first want to ask if this person. You're cutting out again. Dr. Rob. Come back in and first. Okay. 
I'm going to take a deep breath. This isn't about me. Okay. So I have this... a great connection, by the way, to the internet. I think it is our Zoom in Los Angeles that's a problem. Sometimes Zoom goes down because it's so busy. Oh. So it's not You've like You've had connection. that before. Okay. All right. Okay. So here you are back. So start again because we didn't hear any of it. Okay. First of all, I think it's important to understand and look at body dysmorphia. And I would ask if you've seen a psychiatrist or visited someone who really understands that. Sometimes we think we have issues and we read about them on the internet and we say, oh yeah, that's me. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it is. So um, body dysmorphia is generally not considered to be about the face. The face is usually considered facial shame or facial self-hatred or you know, can be related to race, can be related to ethnicity, can be related to all kinds of things. And the fact that you moved somewhere else and became more attractive would speak to me to other issues than, than that. Um, I think it's always the right time to deal with sex addiction because you won't be able to see any other part of your life clearly until you push the addiction aside. Otherwise you're gonna feel shameful and embarrassed and bad about yourself. And, and all those things feed body dysmorphia. So you have to get out of the shame first. So in answer to your question, I would go see a professional about body dysmorphia because I think it's a very specific area of study and it's not something that I would just flippantly talk about. Um, and I absolutely think that getting the support and the direction to heal your addiction is going to be only going to serve you on every level. Um, also your question about needfulness and self-hatred in earlier life leading to sex addiction. I don't really think it works that way. I think that shame and problems like you're talking about in your teens or, you know, reinforce the things that drive sex addiction, but I actually think they happen much earlier. And then we walk out of childhood with shame that gets reinforced in a variety of ways as we get older. Hmm. Thank you. I did not did that know come about, through. Yes, it did. And I did not okay. know body dysmorphia had, like was separate from face. So I don't okay. think it. Yeah. I'm not an expert in body dysmorphia, but my senses know it's about the body. Okay. So the next question, and this sh I think might be the last one that has to go unanswered, but I'm an addict in recovery for just over four months. Discovery was four months ago and disclosure was just about six weeks ago with our therapist. I fully read out of the doghouse twice, once to read it, once to take notes. Great. In my recovery and absence of citing out or must be acting out, I find my core issues of jealousy and envy constantly presenting themselves. Any advice to manage these issues and feelings? Um. I guess my question is, Tammy, I'm gonna ask you to figure this out. Jealousy and envy. Um, if I was an active sex addict, it looks like this person was, and they've just gone disclosure with a partner and they're reading a book about empathy for partners. Um, I'm not sure I understand issues of jealousy and envy. Can you help me understand that? Do you think? I, I, have an idea? I don't know, but I, like, I'm, to me, it's more like, how do we deal with the core issues, whatever they are? You know, when, so, so I, I like take away the jealousy and envy. If you've got like all of a sudden, and this is true, like all of a sudden we're dealing with our core issues. I mean, that's what we do is like, you know, if the addiction is the, you know, it, it, the symptom, the symptom, it's the outward expression, but we're, we're talking about dealing with the inward stuff. How do we deal with the inward stuff, whatever that is? You're muted. That might be intentional. I, was, I may have to reset our our router to get this to work right, and you might lose me for a minute. So okay. Um, do you mind going and doing that? Love? All right, Tammy. So I'm going to reset my router. I'll be gone for a minute. Try to answer questions. Okay, I will try to answer the question to the best of my ability. First of all, it takes time. So you're only four months in, and great, you're four months in. So you're only four months in. You've been avoiding all those uncomfortable not nice feelings for a long time. And so suddenly you're having to be presented with that, including jealousy and envy. Any of those core emotion things are really the unpleasant things that we want to avoid at all costs. So, so here you are. And what do you do? I think some of the things that we were talking about just a moment ago with having, um, having, uh, 
I practice these principles in all my affairs. So, you know, working through the 12 steps, you you are somewhere in the process. I don't know where you are with that, but honestly, you know, I use the first nine steps are to get rid of the wreckage. The 10th, 11th, and 12th are to, um, you know, continue on a daily basis to work on those things and not get a pile up like again of things. So um, I think knowing that you have an awareness, so you're going, oh, I'm jealous. Oh, I'm envious. That's critical because in addiction, we don't care. So for you to have knowledge about that and then to have the ability, hopefully to go, what was triggering for me? Why am I feeling jealous and envious? Who am I feeling jealous and envious about? And is it really about what's happening in the moment or is my perception of the situation more what I'm reacting to? You know, on some of the webinars we've talked about, in fact, last Wednesday, you know, Scott and I talked about um, HALT, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. I use S2 for stressed. And like, if I'm in any of those if, if I have a deficit in any of those, I am more likely to have negative emotions. So, so taking care of myself in all ways, you know, um, spiritually, physically, emotionally, um, you know, get the right amount of sleep, do, you know, do those things gives me more bandwidth and I'm less likely to get jealous and envious. But I think um, we did a, a webinar with Helen, uh, no, Helen, Harriet Hunter, um, recently, and she talked about journaling. And um, I'm not a good journaler, but she's making me a convert because like she taught, like there's all kinds of research and I can't help but think if you're journaling about that jealousy and envy, you know, I mean, you, so you took notes on out of the doghouse. Good. You have skill set to be able to do this. If you start uh, journaling about that, it will be fascinating what comes out of that. And I think you'll start seeing, oh, when this happens. Um, I also think if you haven't already done so, joining Troy Love's um, attachment wounds group, the Friday drop-in group for men, and there's an alternating Thursday for betrayed partners um, would be helpful for you um, because I have a feeling it's bumping into one of your attachment wounds. You know, he talks about his abandonment wound, you know, and um, he talks about lots of things, but, but, you know, like being able to identify what the wound possibly is, because if we're able to go, oh, that's what it is, you know, and be a little distance from it so that we're not just experiencing the emotion. Um, and I'll share this with you because I, I had something that was really a powerful negative emotion for me. I called it my white hot rage and it just would come out out of, it felt like nowhere. Well, that's not true, you know? And so um, I finally figured out that it was, it, it was an abandonment wound. It was actually like every time I felt like there was nobody there for me, you know, and I'm all alone and, you know, woe is me and all of that. And I like the hurt just, I, I just wanted to explode. And um, um, I did some therapy work around that. And honestly, it went away. I have not experienced that since then. And I'm not saying everything's all magic, but I have not experienced that on that level, you know, since that time. So hopefully you take away, there's hope for that. But I really think just identifying in, you know, in some journaling, okay, I'm experiencing that. What was happening before that? You know, it, it none of the stuff happens in a vacuum. There's triggers or you know, things we trip over that, you know, cause us to be more vulnerable to those things. So hopefully that's useful. I'm sorry, Dr. Rob isn't here because he would, I'm sure have something enlightening. Hopefully we'll have time to go back to that. Hello, thanks in advance for answering my question. I'm in therapy with my therapist. My conduct was discovered five months ago. Been clean since, and my wife and I have disclosure in full about a month and a half ago. I disclosed everything truthfully in a five-page disclosure, including how much money was spent on one particular massage therapist. I've been trying to be empathetic, um, putting myself in my wife's pain at times. It's a first step forward, or it's one step forward, two steps back, or two steps forward, I, one step back. My wife still doesn't believe I'm coming out with everything in spite of her, our therapist telling her, I truly believe he's being legitimate. He won't do this again. So feeling frustrated, any suggestions? Hang on, I think Dr. Rob is, um, oh, you, I am here, but I can't get in. Uh, well, there you go. I can't, I do not see you. So let me, Sorry, everybody. This is, oops. Um, 
How do I, so, oh, hang on. I am not rejecting. Oh, so sorry, let me be. Okay, and here we are. Okay, so um, so one of the things, I truly believe he's being legit and he won't do this again. I would never as a therapist say that anybody, I mean, I, I can't guarantee you that I won't act out again. I don't think I will and I'll do my best not to, but um, I, I, I'm kind of surprised that a therapist is willing to put their reputation on the line and say he won't do this again. Can they say this is legit? And um, I believe that, you know, being truthful, that makes sense to me. But, um, but the other is, um, is more challenging for me. So as far as how to build her trust, how, to, you know, uh, it, it takes time. So, so I, I want to say congratulations on five months. Congratulations, you've gone through the disclosure. And so what, you know, so for however long you were, you acted out, you know, now you've been not acting out for five months. So from your wife's standpoint, that's like, this is a little bit of time and you've been lying to me for however long, probably years. So why would I automatically believe you that now all of a sudden you are gonna tell me the truth and that this is never gonna happen again. So I think this is one of those where if you haven't read out of the doghouse, please do so. And being, and you're trying to be empathetic, of course, and that's great, but, um, but it just is going to take a long time for you to rebuild trust and it's actions, not words, you know, lip service from you or your therapist, you know, is only going to go so far. So, um, so I, I think you, I think you have more time to, to go to, for her to see that this is going to be different this time. So, hang in there, keep doing the right things. And you know, it gets better relapse and you reset the clock and actually make a deeper hole for yourself to get out of. Can you give some guideline suggestions in setting effective boundaries as a betrayed partner of a sex addict? I can, um, but I'm going to also give you some resources. There are some really good books on this. Uh, Vicki Tidwell Palmer did a, um, did a, um, setting boundaries book. I can't remember the name of it. It's in our resources list on sex and relationship healing.com under resources. You'll see books and, and she's specifically about that, but your boundaries, I mean, there's some normal boundaries, you know, um, uh, like the 24 hour rule to, to tell the truth, et cetera. But, you know, for some people it's therapeutic, um, separation for some people, it's a separation. You need to go get an apartment for some it's, you know, we're, I mean, what, whatever's, you know, no physical, whatever. I mean, really it's whatever's going to be useful for you. And it kind of depends on what the problematic behavior was too. So, I mean, somebody who is, you know, looking at porn, you know, the, having the filters on, um, on phones, et cetera. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving beyond betrayal. Um, the five-step boundary solution for partners of sex addicts. Yeah. Yeah. That is, thank you for throwing that in there. I couldn't remember the name of the book, but that, that is a really specific guide for helping you set boundaries for you with your partner, 
you know, and what's going to work within the framework of his addiction and, and acting out. Oh, Dr. Rob is back. <gasps> Yay, promote the panelist. We'll see if he's back. Yeah. He's back. I changed uh, computers just for you guys. Okay. So I'm going to put the next question in answered. And then we're going to slide down to this one. So at the end, I'm a betrayed partner who is in love and dating an addict, sex and drugs. Um, and it sounds like an active addict, not a um, recovering addict. Okay, I've okay. been struggling greatly with the issue of trust. Prior to our relationship, I never had an issue with it until he broke it due to his sex addiction. I want to learn and understand why he makes these decisions and we both want to work on how to move past this. I'm always here for him, but I know I can't help but only support. But I also recognize I need support as well. Recently, we lost a baby and it was taken even greater toll on our relationship and has led him to relapse once again after some of the work we had done. Do you have any coping mechanisms for the feeling of betrayal or do you have any tips for him to work through his sex addiction? Well, Tammy, why don't you start with that if that's okay? Cause I have a feeling you have a lot of ideas about this one. I, well, I do. And I, so, so please, you know, no, I, I, you know, my heart breaks for you for the loss of the baby. But I'm also going to say that isn't an excuse for him to go act out. So, so he didn't have enough. Um, he didn't have enough recovery work in process. He didn't have enough support, and he chose poorly. Now, you also go back to the how does he make a decision to do this? In early when we're in active recovery, we don't even decide. Our our brain is just on automatic pilot to go do whatever it is to numb out and escape. When we get some sobriety behind us, when we've got some tools, then we start thinking about things and we have the ability, those, those few seconds to go, is this what I really want to do? Or is this just looking for an escape? So, so it sounds like he didn't have enough, you know, bandwidth in there. And then a huge loss for the two of you, um, you know, happened and set him back on the course, but you said, how do, how do I, you know, regain trust? You can't regain trust. He has to become trustworthy. He has to show you he is trustworthy with his actions. I think this is the third time we've talked about out of the doghouse on this particular webinar, but that is a, a place to start. However, I'm going to mention, we have the next men's uh, sex and porn addiction 101 level one group a work group starting May 3rd. It's a six week course, 90 minutes a session. And the guys find this really useful. It's it's not a pre-recorded. This is a live teaching, you know, and uh, um, you know, the homework is assigned and they you, they bring it back. It's, it's really good. Um, uh, so it's $350 for six weeks, uh, 90 minutes a session. That may be a good foundation piece for him. It would help put in place what's the three circle plan. He'd get some ideas to understand what triggers are to be able to get in advance of it. But he isn't going to be trustworthy until he he shows yes. up differently for you. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So thoughts? I um I really appreciate what you said, Tammy, because of course you want to restore trust, and especially if this is your best friend, the person you're going through a tragedy with or have been, the person we all we need that person. We want to depend on that person, especially when we're pained and Unfortunately, this is what gets pulled out from underneath the partners is this sense that I can trust you and you're my friend and I can rely on you for obvious reasons. And so, you know, what Tammy said for you, I don't know if she mentioned it, but there's a lot of support groups. We give them away for free. There's a lot of things online. Um, you know, we have a website called sexandrelationshiphealing.com. It is a no cost website. It is simply there to provide resources for you guys. And there's endless groups of women who are going through what you've been through. And I bet you went in one of those rooms and talked about losing a baby, you wouldn't be alone either. Um, a lot of women I work with say, oh, I don't wanna go hang out with all those losers and victims of affairs. And it sounds like a cryathon. And what I tell them is that these are some of the most fierce women you are ever gonna meet who are determined to change their lives and improve the, the thing they've been handed. So um, I really encourage you to get your support for you, not depending on him and whatever he does.
As far as him working through the addiction, you know, the first step is always education. And I think there are books, mine and other people that will get them started. I really do like what Tammy said about the online course, because it's designed to give the basics of what is the problem? How do you get through the problem? How do you know you have the problem? How do you develop sobriety for the problem? And I think that, you know, it's a pretty good education in how to, in what the problem is and how to fix it. It may not fix it. I mean, people need treatment, they need therapy, they need all kinds of things, but I think delving into the content and saying, what is this all about? So I can understand it up here is a really good step. If you're looking for therapy or support, Tammy and I always know lots of people. It is TM. T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. Tammy would say it's a four-letter word. Exactly. Tammy. People and, remember it. Uh, and I suggest, you know, if you're looking for partner support, if you're looking for a therapist where you live, if you're looking to find your spouse a therapist, we, we don't get kickbacks for referrals. We just know a lot of people who are good at what they do. And we also know some who aren't so good at what they do. So by all means, reach out and we're glad to, you know, either help you find support or help you find the right person. You know, anything, that's why we're here. So somebody put something in the chat and I have to read it because I'm having a reaction to it. Partner stuff is not relatable to singles. And my thought is if you never want to be in a relationship, then ignore all the partner stuff. Otherwise learn what not to do and what to do in, um, that can be far more helpful in future relationships if you ever want to have one. If you don't ever want to yeah. have one, you I completely ignore it. I want to jump in on that, Tammy. You couldn't be more right. And I would react to this too, because anytime an addict tries to exclude themselves and say, I don't belong here, or I don't want to look at that, or that doesn't apply to me, it tells me there's something to look at. And as Tammy said, what partners work is about, whether or not you're married to someone or dating someone or just getting to know someone is a lot about empathy and compassion and insight. And you want to have a good relationship, relate to the partners. So I also have a feeling about that. I'm really glad you mentioned it. We don't mean to be mean or difficult or be hard on you. It's just, I would strongly disagree with that statement that partner stuff is not related to singles. I think it has everything to do with dating and getting to know somebody and having real Work respect. relationships. I mean, it's like any relationship. If you, if you don't want to have any relationship with anybody ever, you know, then, um, but, but otherwise, if you want to live in this world and connect with human beings, having empathy, being able to relate to other people is a meaningful, useful skill. So, okay. So somebody commented, I recently watched on YouTube out of the doghouse, must be out of the doghouse night, sex addiction, um, infidelity and betrayed spouses. As a betrayed spouse, I would highly recommend this video to others in the same situation. It provided me with confidence to set boundaries without doubting myself. Can the link be posted to those who wish to view and listen to it? If you go to our, if you go to sexandrelationshiphealing.com under resources, you'll see previously recorded webinars, but at the bottom, it also takes you to our YouTube channel and you can easily find that and lots of other um, videos that will be helpful. But thank you for the positive comments on that one. Tammy, do we have a podcast on Out of the Doghouse? I can't remember. Yes, we do. Yes, okay. we have, we've got podcasts on that and ProDepend and we've got podcasts right. on Everything. So, okay. Next question. Oh, I'll put this because I don't think you can see them yet. So, okay. So the next question is, why do some betrayed spouses have shame and others not? Is it because the healthy ones automatically know the SA has nothing to do with them and the unhealthy ones maybe just have too porous of boundaries or something? Thank you. Oh my gosh. I think this is such a sad question to me because um, first of all, I think all betrayed spouses feel some level of shame, whether it's, why didn't I see this? Or why did I pick this person? Or how could I let them do this to me? Or I deserve better or buried in all of that is, you know, why me, why me, why me? And so, you know, whenever we go through tragedy, remorse is part of that. And so, you know, when my dog died, I said, I wish I'd walked him more. I wish I'd taken him out more. I wish I played with him more. When my father passed away, I said, I wish we talked about this. I wish we talked about that. So I think as a betrayed spouse, you can't help but think, well, if I'd done this or if I'd done that, it's a part of the grieving process. So give yourself a break, please. Um, all of us, in experiencing tragedy, wonder what we did wrong or how we could have done it better. That's a part of life. Um, and knowing something intellectually, the partners who seem to have it together, whatever that means, and they know it has nothing to do with them, doesn't 
make them feel any less ashamed. <laughs> it's embarrassing. It's humiliating. It's awful. It's ruined your life. And you should feel terrible about it. Not that I want you to, but it's understandable too. So uh, also, I, we have a saying, Tammy will relate to this. Um, it's really bad idea to compare my insides to someone else's outside. You don't know what those quote unquote healthy partners are really feeling or really going through. You may see them and they seem strong and connected to you because you're so upset with yourself. But a good, and again, I would recommend going to some of the trade partners groups on sex and relationship healing. They are free. Um, but you're going to get a chance to talk to other partners. And, you know, I think when you talk about shame, you're going to get an, an overwhelming, uh, rousing support from everybody in that room. Um, so you want to talk to healthy partners who also understand shame, go into one of the support groups. It's absolutely free. You don't even, you can do this and pretend you don't show your face, but go and listen to those other women. Or if you're a man in one of the men's betrayed partners groups and listen to how they begin to work through. Everyone experiences this, what you call healthy, maybe simply people who've been at this long enough and worked on it hard enough to have gotten beyond some of their shame or self-hatred. But um, every spouse also says, uh, you know, what's wrong with me? Maybe I should have been more attractive. Maybe I should have been, you know, that's just endemic to the issue. Um, I think really talking to other partners who are behind you, like it just happened and ahead of you, like they've been working on it for six months or a year is going to be your salvation. Because this to me speaks of someone, you speak to me of someone who is taking on way too much responsibility and isn't letting yourself be completely okay with hurt and pain. I was thinking the exact same thing, they, the insides compared to the outsides, but also like they may just be further on the journey, you know, they, they, and, and you know, like uh, they may have had something in their past where they had some resiliency towards this and they understood it wasn't them. So, so you just don't know. And uh, just understanding this is where I'm at, accepting that and getting support for where you are, you know, makes a big difference. So. So the next question is, can a betrayed partner move on without a formal disclosure? Well, um, I think part of the question is, what is a formal disclosure? And Great. A formal disclosure is when you see a professional who knows what they're doing in this area, who provides you and your spouse or you and the addict an opportunity to get all the information. Um, I think... I don't think it's about a betrayed partner moving on without disclosure. I think it's about the coupleship moving on without disclosure. Um, I know lots of partners, and first of all, let me say this. I have worked with partners who have strong religious beliefs, who have strong beliefs of various kinds, and I've had them say, look, for example, my spiritual life and religion tells me that I cannot leave my spouse, that I have to remain with them. That's my duty and responsibility. That's what some religions speak to. And this woman said, I don't want to know these things because I would feel like I had to leave him and I don't want to leave him because of my beliefs. So I don't want to know. Well, that made perfect sense to me. Some women are pregnant. Some women are emotionally struggling. Someone just died. Not everyone partner is ready for or willing to or wants to do disclosure. Disclosure is simply an inventory of things that the partner did not know about. And the goal of disclosure, the primary reason we do disclosure is if a couple is choosing to go forward, we want you to have a foundation of trust that is established by all of the crappy stuff being on the table so you can wipe it all away or at least understand what it was to begin to build a new foundation for each other. So as a if I were a partner or a spouse, I would have a difficult time going forward as an equal to my partner, knowing how good they are at lying and cheating. I would want to know to some degree where I missed things, what I didn't see, what happened that I didn't know about, or it would be very hard for me to continue in an intimate loving situation. Um, I also understand partners that don't want to know because they don't want to hate the person they love, but sometimes you got to hate us for a while. And as I say to so many of you guys, and I'll say it over and over again, the, especially the addicts, the opposite of hate is not, I mean, the opposite of love is not hate. You know, if I have a partner who's freaking furious at somebody, I think, well, they're engaged. They're emotionally, passionately feeling anger. And however, the opposite of love is indifference. And so if a partner gets to a point or you get to a point as an addict where you just think, you know, whether we stay together or not really is immaterial, then I think we're looking at the possible end of a relationship. Anyway, that was a little more than when asked, but yeah. What else you got, Tam? The next question is... I think I like the next question. Oh, can you see them now? I can see the, uh, the, the, once you start going, I can pretty oh, much see. Okay. 
I have recently connected with some potential sponsors after a long time dragging my feet. My or one potential sponsor suggests doing the first nine steps in three months and another suggests going much slower, maybe taking up to a year to do the first nine and using Patrick Karn's book, The a Gentle Path as an outline. How long should the first nine steps take and what are the pros and cons of each timeline? Tammy, I would appreciate if you would start that because you are as familiar with 12-step recovery as I am and I would love to hear your thoughts about it. Sure. So when the, the founders of AA first started, they did the 12 steps with somebody like in the moment. So in the first couple of hours, they'd sit them down, do that. And then they do it again. And then they do it again. So it was like, do it and do it again. Um, because more is revealed as you, you go do deeper. I think the first nine steps are super helpful for cleaning up the, the trash, the, you know, all the, sh the shame is in those first nine steps. So if we work on getting rid of that, I, I think having an arbitrary three months or nine months or a year, I mean, like that is less useful. It's really about what's going to be most helpful for you. People, and, and I've been around the tables a long time, people that hang out on step four, don't get around to step four, don't really do a step four, don't do a step five. Those are far more prone to a relapse. So I really do encourage that. Mm -hmm. Now for some, for my steps eight and nine, I, um, I was intentional about some of them. Some of them were living amends and some of them were, people would come come to me. Like I, I will always remember, I ran into somebody at the bookstore and I was like, <gasps> on my list, on my list. And I was like, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go do this right now. And I did. And it was so fascinating because it was like this major ordeal in my life and it's on my list. And this person was like, it's all good. You know, we're, and so, so a huge burden lifted off to me. So, so I don't think there's a timeline specifically that, you know, the magic's in so much, but I think doing it sooner is my preference, particularly getting through uh, steps one through five you know, and, and continuing with that. So that's my two cents on that. I would call that three cents, Tammy. <laughs> um, I, I, I concur. I mean, if you got someone to take it through you, take it, if you have someone to take you through it in three months, do it. And then when you're done with that, pick up the Karin's book, Gentle Path, and start it again. Um, you know, this is like biblical scripture or meditations, or, you know, we're not done with this because we've gone through it. We, I think of addicts like this, I feel like we are like a soapy bottle. You know, when you want to take the soap out of a bottle and you shake it up and you pour the water out and you're like, oh, okay, I'm sure that's out of there. And then you pour more water in and it's still bubbly. It takes us a long time to keep filling up and pouring out and filling up and pouring out. And that process doesn't end because we've done this once. In fact, if you understand the 12 steps, there are steps in there that we do over and over again for the rest of our lives. So, and Tammy will tell you, I've gotten mad at her and had to go back and apologize <laughs> and take responsibility for it. So not just so we could get along, but because I didn't want to be responsible for having been angry in that way. Not recently, Tammy, I don't think. No. But my point is, is that um, the steps are alive. This process is alive. It's not a like some kind of document you look at occasionally. I have to live by, and it is another way of saying this. I've always looked at the 12 steps as being a guideline for living as being basic rules to how to be a decent human being, which I never learned growing up. Unfortunately, I had, um, I had parents who didn't understand how to parent and were deeply troubled. And so I didn't really learn about honor and respect and integrity. And I just didn't learn about that. In fact, my dad used to be the kind of guy who was like, if you can steal it, take it, you know? So mm. he was not the best person. So um, I don't think that you, you can live by this and you can also continue to do it over and over again. Um, so I think those are our answers, right, Tam? Yes. And I had to make an amends. I was on a phone call the other day with a mutual person we know. And anyway, I was, I was, I'll use the word snippy. And so I hung up the phone and a few minutes later, I called back and I said, you, I, I, I'm making amends. I, you, that was not professional of me. That wasn't good. And and this person was like, oh, I thought we were having a discussion. I was like, yeah, but I had a snippy attitude about it. So, you know, but I think that person would have disregarded it and, but it wasn't okay with me. So it really is about right. me cleaning up my side of the street, regardless of what somebody else thinks. I know that I was wrong in that moment. So, and I also want to say that there's something in the 12 steps that I really love, which is about talking, looking at your character defects, meaning looking at 
the ways of thinking, the ways of relating people, the ways of living um, that really don't work for you. You know, um, me putting myself first doesn't work for me, but boy, I've been in a lot of situations where, and I had to learn that it is one of my character defects that I can think about what I want and charge ahead without thinking about the fact that I'm married or I work with other people or so, you know, I will almost always have to go back and say, gee, I'm sorry, I ran ahead of this before you. Can we agree before I go forward? So, you know, I don't think that the steps eliminate our problems, but they are a constant reminder of what we need to work on. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I, you know, like I, I fixed the relationship so that the relationship can move forward. And I wasn't having to hide from that person because, oh my goodness, what I do. It's just a better way to live. So, and by the way, for those of you who don't know what the 12 steps are is when you go to AA or NA or CA or SA or one of those meetings, it's basically, um, it's a, it's a place to start at the beginning and work your way through. And people who are coming the door, they have to start at the beginning and they actually have steps that they go through to for personal growth, for spiritual growth, to be better people. And that's what they're about. And I put, so our dear friend, Charlie Rizian is amazing. Like she broke down the 12 steps word by word, and I'd never gone through that before. And so I put the link to those videos in the chat, but it's on sexandrelationshiphealing.com under resources, you'll see video library. And I think you'll find that useful. Another colleague of ours, um, Kristen Snowden, has been going mm -hmm. through this year Life Anonymous, which is the 12 steps for anybody, not specifically for any particular addiction. And so, she, so that's a really good guidebook. Um, and and we've gone through April. So so those videos are in the resources. But she's going to be on step five, you know, uh, for May. So join us for those too. So, okay. So here's a great question: What is Dr. Weiss's view on uh, sex addiction for? Oh wait. What is Dr. Weiss's view on the sex addict taking a polygraph to help his partner trust him again? Well, um, I have a view. I've had a view for uh, 25 years. Um, I think that my understanding, and I think those of us as some of the founders and leaders in the field have become distorted in some ways over time. Um, the original intent, and my, I believe the, the only real reason to do a polygraph is for when you are involved with a partner who has been lied to so many times. You know, there was this, and then there was that, and then there was dribbling information, and then, and then maybe they found out, and three years later there was more, and then they found, you know, I think it's for the partner who over a series, for over a period of time in a series of ways has been lied to to the point where they really don't think that they, they really don't think that a disclosure or the information they're gonna get is the whole story. Now, I know every partner feels like they're not getting the whole story and they want to be sure that they are. And so they want to polygraph. But I don't think that that's necessarily what's useful, even though a partner may want it. Uh, I think what is actually more useful in the beginning when people are starting out is to begin to develop trust without having to prove it. Um, I don't necessarily expect that someone in drug addiction treatment when they first go home is going to get drug tested every week, you know, but if they have a relapse, then we might consider they need to be tested to hold them accountable. Um, I think polygraphs exist in our world, in the sex addiction world, for partners who have been uh, repeatedly lied to over a period of time in different situations, not for the single first, I found everything and we went to disclosure. Um, I think there does come a point where you want to be shown that what you're being told is true and you want it guaranteed. But I think it is um, abusive and problematic and somewhat unprofessional, unethical to say, well, every partner gets a polygraph every time because every situation that I deal with as a therapist is different. Every person I deal with is different. Every couple I deal with is different. And the needs of one group, one couple, one individual may be very different than another. And one, I might sit down with a couple and say, oh my God, you got to do a polygraph. And I might sit down with another couple and say, well, why don't we try trust and hope and, and, and trusting what they're doing and let's see how it works out. And then, and I know no partner wants to feel this way again. I know partner, no partner wants to be betrayed again. No partner wants to stumble down, down that set of stairs. But even if you get a polygraph, what does it mean for the future? All it means is that we haven't lied to you in the past. It doesn't, or we've told you everything in the past. It doesn't mean you have any idea what we're going to do tomorrow when we walk out the door. And I actually think trusting us in a larger way, not just, or coming to trust us, which can take a year or more, coming to trust us in, in a more global way than 
what they're telling me about the past is true and that's all I need to learn, I think it's a, it's a better way of working. And I can tell you in the, I don't know, Tammy, how long I ran an outpatient practice where I used to see people one-on-one in groups. I think it was about 10 years that I ran a practice. And I think I did five polygraphs in the hundreds and hundreds of people that I saw. However, I will say that it has become kind of a, I don't know what you call it. It's like a pop sensation in my addiction world that everyone wants a polygraph and everyone gets a polygraph and a polygraph and answered all my problems. And, you know, I just don't think it's that useful um, except for certain individuals in certain circumstances. Um, and I also think it leave, gives partners a false sense of security. Tammy, well, and you I've had have people, been through this road so many I times. I have. <laughs> we, we've talked about it a, a number of times. But you know, it's not like you see on TV where there's a hundred questions that they're asking. You know, the the person who's being arrested or whatever. I mean, it's like you get like three questions, and it, and it is talking about the past. It's got nothing to do with the future. You know, and while past behavior can predict the future, really, when somebody's trying to change completely, you know, I was lying, and I, now I'm working to tell the truth, and it's going to be incremental. You know, then then I do think having hope, but it has become commonplace that you know, like that's kind of what people do. But uh, you know, and not every polygraph. Uh, polygrapher is polygrapher. Qual- yes is qualified to to do i mean you, you don't like you really want to have this set up for a success so how do you have that it's having somebody who knows what they're doing if you absolutely you know are in a, a situation where you do i i also think that the thank you tammy that the idea of everyone needs a polygraph and every partner should demand it it comes from some therapists who I think particularly negative and if you excuse the word entitled, like every spouse deserves and I deserve and I know all you spouses feel entitled to be properly loved, entitled to honesty, entitled to, these are the bare minimums that you are entitled to in any relationship. But I don't think you're entitled to a polygraph. I think that you can ask for one and see what the situation bears. But this idea that every spouse deserves this and they should have it. And not only do I not think it's productive, but I don't think it gives the spouse spouse what they really want. It's kind of like spouses, and I completely understand this, and loved ones who, you know, if I'm a spouse, I'll say, and Tammy was an addict, I'd say, did you do this? Did you do that? Did you do this? And she'll answer my questions. And then I'll say, well, this is the last one. I'm never going to ask you another question. And then she answers that, and I have 20 more. The polygraph is similar in a way. You think you're going to, and spouses are always looking for this, the bottom, the bottom line, what is everything? And the truth is, is the polygraph, you know, you're not going to necessarily get it from that. And, And Tammy's So the way a polygraph works is there's like 30 different questions, but you can only respond to one or two. The rest of them are throwaways. And you can ask questions like, did they love me? Or do they still love me? Or that's all useless. The only thing we can really polygraph to is if someone does a disclosure list, we can do a polygraph that says, is this the truth? Or is this everything that you are aware of? Or, and we can pretty much polygraph to the disclosure. But to me, I don't think it's where I would want to go in a relationship at the beginning stages of healing. Um, but I'm an addict, so what do I know? Mm, a lot. Okay, so the next question. I'm confused. I understand that each essay creates their own three circle plan, but I also understand that continuing certain behaviors continues the dopamine hit. My essay stopped looking at porn and masturbating, but looks at pictures of profiles of women still. He apparently gets a hit from his fantasies when he looks. He said it's not breaking his sobriety because it's not in his inner circle, but it seems he's still going to the for the dopamine hit before, from the behavior. He told me he doesn't want to give it up, that it's all he has left. Now he's backtracking, saying he doesn't want those lustful feelings and hopes over time the feelings won't be so strong. What I know is that the behavior is still hurtful and threatening to me since he started there and crossed boundaries physically with a number of women. Thoughts? Well, I think that at a certain point, if we're going to be in real recovery, true recovery, and we could waver in and out, it involves this word that, I, that does come from the 12-step programs called surrender. And a surrender means I want to do this, I want to do that, but I'm not going to because it's not good for me or it's not good for us. And so much of the answer to your question lies to me in the last sentence, which is what I know is that behavior is hurtful and threatening to me. 
That's all I need to know. You love this person. You want to be this person with this person. You want to have a meaningful relationship with them again. And they're not respecting things that leave you feeling hurt and threatened. That's not a relationship. That's an addict running the show. So I think your addict, the man you're married to or in a relationship with is doing a lot of this with not a whole lot coming out. And we said that walk on the walk, but not talk on the talk. I mean, talk on the talk, but not walk on the walk. Sorry about that. So um, I would encourage you to sit in some of the betrayed partners groups with some of those other fierce women who are not going to put in. Let me try this more, more directly. There is no effing way that I would put up with that. I would not allow someone who says they love me and says they're working on it, but they just have to keep looking at these images. That's like an alcoholic saying, you know, well, I've given up all of the whiskey and the sh and all the vodka, but I just have to have a few glasses of wine in the evening. It's like, no, you're either off alcohol or you're not. And it's not that someone might not see a film or a photo and feel aroused or interested in it. I mean, that's part of being human. Even though I am a recovering sex addict, and even though it may bother my partner, I might look at someone and find them attractive. That's human. However, to conjure up photos and images and movies to keep my head engaged in, in this objectification of others is a bad idea. And I agree that, um, well, I agree this is hurtful. I agree this feels like a betrayal. I would feel threatened. And I think rather than anything that your partner says, you have to trust your feelings and say, I'm not gonna be in a home where someone is threatening me and leaving me feeling painful. Um, and what am I gonna do? In other words, you need to stand up to this guy and say, you know what, that's not acceptable to me and I deserve better. And you know what, I can change the locks. If, you know, in fact, you're out back, always oh, backtracking. I thought he was backpacking. <laughs> um, you know, the other thing to do might be to invite him here where you can ask the question in front of him and I'll be more than glad to tell him that he's full of shit and that he should surrender and stop running the show and show some humility for the partner who he's harmed. How can you hold up the idea of, I wanna look at these pictures compared to I love you and I've hurt you and I've ruined your life and who would fight for something like photos? So I don't think this man understands the gravity of what he's done to his relationship. I think he's got a partner who is still tentatively wanting to work it out rather than really looking at things for what they are. You live with a liar, you live with someone who's deeply broken and you're living with someone who wants to keep living a lifestyle on some level that is completely unacceptable to you. Trust your gut and act on it is my thought. I was looking forward to that question. Well, I, and you said a lot and I only wanna take on when you're focused on the inner circle, you're missing the outer circle, which is all the amazing things like a connection with you. It, it, the, the outer circle is the healthy behaviors that are, give us meaning in life. Looking at pictures, like Dr. Rob said, he's looking at pictures and that's like his big thing. Like that's such a small little tiny world. Right. And why it's not in his inner circle seems like, you know, a miss, but, but regardless of that, that's a minor point on what is a major issue. So, okay, so uh, go ahead. Real quick, Tammy, I wanna just say for those who don't understand a circle, plan. So if you understand in Alcoholics Anonymous, they can simply say, not simply, Tammy, you know what I mean, I'm not going to drink anymore. And that is the commitment. Um, if you have a gambling disorder, uh, I never am going to gamble again. And that's the commitment. Um, if you have a, a spending disorder, you're going to put your life in order, you're going to follow certain rules, but you can't live your life without eating. You can't live your life without sex. Um, I guess you can't live your life without spending either, but that's a whole different issue. So Unlike drug addicts and alcoholics who can put down what their problem is and never engage it again with a lot of support and help. Um, and in fact, I would say many alcoholics and drug addicts lose a lot of their desire to use and drink over time, although it comes back under stress. Um, I wanna have sex the rest of my life and people with eating disorders and eating addictions, they wanna eat the rest of their lives. So the circles are a, a way of organizing and we actually teach this, I think, in the, uh, I know we teach this in the seminar series, the, the one the for addicts, sex right? and porn addiction level one work group. Next one starts May 3rd, seekingintegrity.com. Thank you, Tammy. So we actually teach it. And um, by the way, for those, if you are any of your spouses and the person you're involved with, who's an addict says, well, I don't want to show you my plan. That's private. That's personal. That belongs to my program. Think again because you have every right as a spouse to see exactly to the letter, what we are saying should, should be practiced by us, should not be practiced by us, and what are the warning signs? And that's what a circle plan is. It's a definitive explanation of what we are not to do, what we are going to call acting out. 
and what we are going to call health with a whole other section for warning signs and signs of trouble and triggers and all of that. Um, I think every spouse should feel safe and comfortable with the plan that your addict has created because that is the, those are the rules they're living by. And if you're in a relationship with them and you don't agree with the rules, that's a problem. So the next question, my porn addict partner of 10 years, first D-Day was March of 2020. He has relapsed twice since then, most recently a month ago. We are doing a therapeutic separation while he is not living in our home. He says he wants help and to heal his broken relationship. When will he realize that he needs to see a CSAT and he will need an accountability partner and just listening to podcasts is not enough? It doesn't seem like things are progressing fast enough for me to feel safe around him. Well. We do run a treatment center called Seeking Integrity, and you can look that up at seekingintegrity.com, and I am involved in treatment um, on a regular basis. And I have to say that um, if you've got a partner who you know, is continuing to relapse despite the pain that they've caused you, I mean, D-Day was a year ago, March was a year ago, and they're continuing to act out. Now you're separating. He says he wants help. Um, I, first of all, I'll say a couple of things. If I were in a relationship where I'd had to separate from a partner who I loved, I would pretty much be willing to do some very simple things like see a particular therapist or read a particular book or go to, they seem like minor things. It might be hard to get, get this guy or this woman's butt into treatment, which is often the most useful thing. But, but the fact that they're unwilling to even see the therapist that you recommend makes me wonder if they really wanna be in the relationship. Um, it doesn't take much to break someone's heart, but it takes an awful lot of work to help heal it. And um, if this man or woman is not willing to take responsibility for the things that certainly us professionals would agree is the right next step, then I think you have to look at the health and possibilities this relationship does or not does not have to offer. And I know that no spouses want to hear that. By the way, um, someone who is not living at home with me, my partner, and has relapsed multiple times, I think they're probably at their new place doing exactly what they've always been doing. And uh, why would they not? Now they don't have any accountability. Now they don't live with a partner. Now that they're free to do whatever the heck they want. And so I really wouldn't believe much that comes out of his mouth, I have to say, unless you're seeing each other in therapy regularly, unless he's gone to treatment, unless he's going along with the things you're requesting, I will just assume that he wants to keep doing what he's doing and keep you quiet. Yeah, I thought that when will he realize that he needs to see us? He said he's been a year and he's only, I mean, the podcasts are great, but they're all by themselves again. Like there's no connection with other people. There's no accountability. There's nothing. So, so, I mean, listening to a podcast is a passive thing, not interactive and doing the work you need to do to do different. So, so I'm with Dr. Rob, like this person does not seem like like he's at all interested in doing anything to heal himself. So you, you know, you may be looking at a more permanent um, separation, so. I will add one thing before I know we're out of time, Tammy. Um, Tammy uh, often books me to do consultations and I'm not doing therapy, but I do consult for couples, especially in this situation where one partner is saying, I don't know how to handle this. You're not doing, you're not doing this. And I, you know, I'm there to help clarify and be the authority to say, I think these are the things you really need to do. And we've had people come to treatment after those interventions and discussions. Um, so I'm not available for ongoing therapy. I'm not, you know, but I'm really, I think, very good at assessing a couple's circumstances and being able to give them direction, whether they take them or not, is up to them. Um, and those things I, you can be booked through Tammy. But yes. Laura, well, we give I'm away a lot more. more. Yes, but ahead, I want to add one more thing to it because so yes, some people have come to, to therapy. Sometimes it's been partners having the clarity that this person is going to absolutely refuse to do anything. And just knowing that, you know, the, like now you've done everything that you can and, and knowing that, okay, I, you know, I need to come up with a different plan, you know, I think is really validating. You know, I hear that from the partners. Um, I'm always hopeful that people want help and can change and, and do things, but sometimes somebody's just dug their heels in and refuses. So, but so knowing, you know, that we've done what we think we need to do, and I'm not going to get any change from that person. 
And by the way, right. as an addict, the longer I can hold off change, the longer I will. The longer I can keep you, the partner, quiet, the longer I can keep spinning my plates when you're not looking. That's what I'm going to do. It really that it takes surrender and you will see and feel surrender when you see and feel it, because it isn't just, well, I'm doing this, but I'm not doing that. And why do you keep asking me this? It's I just want this to get better and I'll do whatever it takes. That's what surrender looks like. Hey, Tammy, I'm sorry for the Zoom junk we had tonight. But I'm I sure just grateful you this. showed up and thank you. Thanks to everyone who was here. Yeah. Um, Dr. Rob is on in the rooms on Friday night, every Friday night at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Lots more resources, drop-in groups, uh, webinars this week on sexandrelationshiphealing.com and reach out if we can be of help. Thank you, everybody. And for those guys who are at the treatment center, I will be doing a lecture for you tomorrow. So watch there out. You here I come. <laughs> right. Bye Thanks, for everybody. now. Bye.